you. Um, my name is Emily. I'm a PHP developer from North Carolina, like we said. I'm a director of Women Who Code and a organizer for the Triangle PHP meetup in my area. I'm also a competitive axe thrower and a crocheter, among many other things. <laughs> so I love legacy, and I think they're fantastic systems to learn from. I think they get a really bad rep, like uh, Eric Evans said. It was, there's, they're just so ripe for opportunities, and I think event sourcing is really great for helping our legacy systems evolve and break from some of their fixed patterns. And I love this image. As much as I liked the picture of the tree being bolstered, I was really glad that the tree was being saved. Um, what I recognized in a lot of the legacy applications that I've worked on is that they started out needing to do one thing, be a knife. And then over time, the needs changed. Maybe the users asked for some other things. And at the end, you end up with a fork. <laughs> and it's, it's really surprising that someone was able to turn this knife into a fork. It's really ingenious. Um, and this happens a lot in our legacy systems. So for this talk, I plan to talk about some of the basics of event sourcing, because I think a lot of times dialing it back to the beginning is important. And then talk about three different projects that I've worked on uh, that used event sourcing as a strategy for improvement. Uh, the example that I'm going to try to carry through the explaining the basics is an event source library um, because I think a library where you check out books is a pretty simple uh, domain to talk about. So I think probably throughout the conference, uh, most of what we're talking about and learning about is difficult and it can make your brain hurt a little bit. So I think above all, be kind to yourself. Be patient with yourself and others while you're learning. Um, and just in general, like any tool, this isn't for everything, but it's a really good tool. So the fundamental idea of event sourcing is that you're ensuring every change to the state of an application is captured in an event object, and that these events are stored in, events, in the sequence that they were applied for the same lifetime as the application state itself. So the sequence is super important. The order that these events happened needs to stay the same forever. So we have an event. It recognizes that something happened in our space, in our application. And we have these listeners. That's a little ear with lips. Um, <laughs> it says, I care about that, and I'm going to do something about it. That event is important to me. So a type of event that we might have in our library is that we might have book was checked out. And what do we need to know when a book is checked out? We need to know the patron, the person who's checking out the book. We need to know about the book that's being checked out. Um, and we probably need the date. Uh, you want to look at your event that happened and think about what are the time sensitive things that you want to save and store in your event. And you store those attributes. But you only want to save what you need to preserve. You probably don't need to save the whole book, because the title and author are going to stay mostly the same, the ISBN number, all of that. So you can use the book ID as a reference point to your book. And same for the patron. You don't want to store all of the information about the patron. Their address may change. And if you want to find out about that patron again, and they've moved, you're looking at an old address. So if your system has a way to look up the patron, then all you need to store for your event is the ID. And then we have our date. There are some standard rules for events. And I think these are pretty good ones to keep in your head and stick with as best as you can. But like a lot of rules, depending on your system, sometimes you might need to fudge it a little bit. But I think these are good rules to stick to. And I'll explain why. You name your event using past tense verbs because it's a thing that actually happened. It's not really going to change because you can't rewrite history. Um, it's already happened. It is what it is. And uh, we also never delete an event because the 
fact that that thing happened is still significant. Um, our system may evolve to where we don't care about that event and we can stop listening to it anymore. But, uh, but deleting them and changing our history devalues the whole idea behind keeping the event store. And our event will have attributes that are values, uh, specific values. We're not storing, like I said, the book object. We're storing a book ID. If there are multiple attributes about that entity that we need to store, then we can save those individual attributes as part of our event. So when I say we never delete events, we want to keep our historical record accurate. And Greg Young uses a really good example with accounting that you don't ever see a picture of an accountant erasing a line in their ledger because that devalues and discredits the ledger that they've kept for the books on this bank account. So when an accountant has a problem, like maybe they typed in $500 for a deposit instead of 50, because accidents do happen, they will issue a correction. And so in our system, we want to think about issuing a correction event to undo that so that we're not changing our history in a way that we can't fully support and describe how our space has changed. So an accountant would have this accidental deposit of $500 event, but then issue a correction against that and later the event for the deposit that they actually wanted to have happen. And we don't store objects because one of the best things about event sourcing is that you have an event that records the things you need to know about the thing that happened. And the rest of your system can evolve and change. But if you are starting to store your objects into the event, it reduces the flexibility of these objects to change in the future. Um, maybe you add an attribute to your object. Maybe you take one away. But if you are trying to reconstitute that object after it has evolved in this way, you have to now put in some code that takes that into account, that knows how to change from object version one to object version two. And it isn't that you can't do it, it's that should you. <laughs> it's a lot of weight to carry in your object to remember that, oh, I was storing an event that looked like this and stored in object version one, but now I also want my object to be aware of itself in version two. It's just a lot of weight. And it makes, it prevents your system from growing in the ways that you want to when you're using an event source system. So like I said, events rarely change because that part of the code that you want to change is that other space. The interpretation of those events can change because you have the historical record. Um, so that structure, structured data that you need is a lot more likely to change. If you think about building a reports interface, you almost always end up adding columns to it, adding more detail that people want to know. And, uh, and when that has changed in a system where you haven't factored in events, it can be a lot of work to try to either ignore that you don't have that information in the past or now um, reconstitute that whole table, like rebuild that table. Events will help you with that. So we have our event and we have some listener that's listening for that event and it has an apply method for that event specific to it and it says, well, in this context, where I am right now, this is what I think about the fact that the book was checked out. And it may update my table into a result set for what I need to know. But if that ever changes, that's OK. We could write a new apply method for the same event and treat it completely differently and build an entirely new result set. And that's just great, because we haven't lost the history of what happened with those events. And we can play those super, super old events and write it into this new format. It's really, really powerful. But we also have, a lot of times, different contexts for the people who are looking at this data. We have different types of users who may, um, a librarian, for example, may be looking at the bookshelf 
of all the books that are still checked in and only care about those for this one view. In another case, a patron, they shouldn't really be able to see other people's books that they've checked out. They really only need to see their own. And you have the ability to interpret these events and build result sets that match what you need in specific parts of your application. So we use events because these state transitions are important. We want an audit log and we want that history of what's happened in our application to always be there, no matter how we decide to use it. Because that history is more important than the actual state. And these events are replayable whenever our application changes. So I usually store these events in a domain message and they're the domain message is like a wrapper that describes the things that are the same across all of your events. A unique identifier, the type of event that it might be, I mean, that's just a name of it, a uh, timestamp to help manage sequence or a version for the event if you need to have that event evolve in the future. There are some other attributes that you might choose to put in. These these are the main ones that I like to use for examples. And then the payload itself is the event. So all of my events are going to have these UUID type, timestamp, and version, but the events themselves can be distinct depending on the type of event that they are. I'm going to store them in an event store, which is a domain specific database. So in some situations, you may choose to store multiple event stores, but there's absolutely no reason that you can't put them all in the same place. There is a concept of streams where you can distinguish them even further than just the name of the event, but on a very simple level, for all of my examples, we're in one event store that has a domain message and the payload itself is the event. And we're using a publish subscribe message pattern to pick which events we care about. So we may have a projector that knows about three different types of events. And when it sees those types of events, it does its thing, it applies that event, and then it builds a result set of data. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to go into PHP code. <laughs> um, so then we have a read model that will look at that projection, that table, resulting table that we've created. And it can look things up and report things back to our application. Uh, if a librarian wants to see all the books that are checked in, they can do a query from the read model to look this up. If, um, if we wanna see all of the books checked out by a specific patron, we can do that. And we just have different, uh, different ways to look up that information using the read model. We only create these events after we've done whatever validation we need to do to know that this thing can happen. Because it's not that we had the potential to check out a book. Yes, this book exists, but it's actually checked out right now. I can't check out the book because it's not on the shelf. So. Um, you need to do those checks before you create the event. This can happen in a controller method if you're in a CRUD system. You can use commands and handlers, which we'll talk about just a little bit. Um, but you're only creating that event class after you've validated that it can happen. So we may have a user who is interacting in our system and they send some request that creates this check check out book command. It's an action, like a thing that's going to happen because that's a good pattern for naming your commands. And then we might have a handler that knows what to do with that command. And after it's handled it, it does its checks and it creates our che book was checked out event. This is where we get into the command query response segregation, which is usually listed alongside event sourcing doesn't always have to be there, but in a lot of spaces it can be really helpful. So this is an architecture pattern that is really commonly put with event sourcing. 
and you're looking at your application in two parts. The command is any method that's going to mutate state, make changes in your application writes. And a query is any method that's returning a value, doing lookups and reads. Um, this pattern only works in certain parts of your application. It's not as easy to apply in other places. Some places it'll start feeling forced or contrived, and that's usually a sign that you don't really need it here. Um, but our command handler, like I said, it's going to do its checks to make sure that the event can happen. It's going to validate that the command is correct, that its attributes are valid attributes of that type, that um, it's going to validate the command on the current state of the aggregate, like, can I check out a book? It's not actually on the shelf, so it's going to do those types of checks. And then providing everything is valid, it's going to create that event. The command handler will also attempt to persist the new events, and if there's a concurrency conflict, it'll, try, it'll retry it or exit. CQRS can really help you with optimization of your system because when you have a separate service for reads versus a service for writes, then you can handle those differently and you can balance your servers better for, for those types of load. If you have a very read-heavy system, but you're also trying to write in the same spaces, you can't optimize in that way because you've got too many things going on in the same space. So when you're able to make distinctions between your commands and your queries, it can be very, very helpful and powerful. But as with all tools, you have to choose what is best for your system. Now we're going to talk about some of my projects. The first two, the scholarships and course registration, were when I was working at a university. And um, the threat reports, my most recent job, which I just left on Friday, um, at a network security company called Inquest. They're still valid examples, even though I don't work there anymore. <laughs> so the scholarships application was a very large uh, code igniter application that I was supposed to edit and uh, make these couple small changes over two week period, writing it in production. It was a big, awesome ball of mess. But um, this application was super important. And it, its importance had been escalated because the previous year, a lot of scholarships did not get awarded to students, which meant that some students probably couldn't stay in school for that semester or that year because they needed to go find money. The, the, the College of Engineering where I was working was really, really invested in making this application work. But when we started investigating the problems that were happening, there was a lot more under the hood. There were a lot of problems in the application that didn't work the way our stakeholders thought they did. It gave the presentation of working, but it didn't actually do it. And we decided a full rewrite was necessary. But to help you understand the context, we had our students. And they put in an application, and we hoped that they would tell us as much about themselves as they possibly could so that we could use that criteria to match them for scholarships, because we wanted them to be able to go to school. We had our engineering foundation, and they managed relationships with the donors, kept track of the budgets and how much money could be given to these students. Um, and they kept track of the criteria that the donors wanted a recipient to meet. And we had our selection committee that also cared about those criteria and the money, but in a little bit different way. They were very invested in finding the right students to receive that money. And a little bit outside of our system, the selection committee, after they had chosen the students, would report to the financial aid office what awards were to be given. And so we needed to be able to send that to the financial aid office, but it was a bit outside of our application. We recognized that we had some bounded context. It was really three of them, the students, the engineering foundation, and the selection committee. We had a lot of common things. We had the scholarship. We had criteria that the students should match. We had money for that scholarship. We had different departments in the College of Engineering that were 
awarding to students who were in their department. But that scholarship meant different things in different contexts. To the student, it was really just money. Occasionally there were some things that they needed to do for the donor, but for the most part, it was the money that allowed them to go to school. The Engineering Foundation really wanted the money to be given away, wanted the criteria to be observed, but we really needed to solve the problem of giving the money away. So we had our event store in the middle of our bounded context. We had our students who submitted the application. The Engineering Foundation, once it had money available, would allocate funds for a certain scholarship. And that scholarship had its criteria defined. And the selection committee, when it chose a student to receive that, they would encumber the scholarship funds, which meant it's an accounting term to say that there was money available and we encumbered that money. Maybe there was $2,000, but we only encumbered $1,000 to say that we want to give this scholarship to a student, but they haven't received the money yet. We haven't actually given it to them. This was helpful for the selection committee to find the best scholarship package for the students based on their need. And then when we reported the scholarship was given to a student to financial aid, then we would have an event that said the money was spent and it was no longer available. We were told pretty early on that the selection committee would never take this money away from a student. And once it was given to them, that's true, they never would. But uh, we did find a situation where that was not the case because this stuff always happens. Um, and the situation was during that planning, they had found a student and given them an award which didn't quite meet their need. Then they found another scholarship that they were a better match for that gave them their full need package. So they wanted to move it or they wanted to undo this first one and give them the new one. And it was great, but our system didn't have a way of, of doing that. So we ended up deleting those two events for what had happened because we needed to make sure that we implemented a better solution for it. And then we introduced the ability to remove a scholarship from a student and an event for when that scholarship was reported to financial aid. And that event served as a blocker in our system to prevent them from moving, removing a scholarship after it had been reported to financial aid. It was kind of a lock. We also um, had our new academic year, and because universities are really well organized, um, we found out after all of this development that they were going to buy a, pack, a piece of software that was going to replace this thing that we had worked on so hard. And, but we needed to make it work for one more year. So we uh, backed up our event store, all of our projections, everything that had our record of the first year of scholarships being awarded, and then we emptied the tables and we started fresh. <laughs> I don't think we would have done that if it had not been for the time sensitivity and trying to allocate time for another project. We were able to modernize the code in pieces, but we bid off a big DDD project in a year with three developers and um, over time we lost some of those developers and it was a good learning opportunity, but because of the demands on our developers, it was not well implemented. So it was kind of a blessing <laughs> that this other software package came along. But with this application, we were able to view these events that were significant from multiple perspectives and treat them differently based on those contexts. And we were flexible to those changes that did come up in our application for its short lifespan. So the next project is the student enrollment process. This was for distance education students who weren't always in the same town as us. They wanted to take classes at the university. And it was basically handling a lot of form letters back and forth between the administrators who were helping students get registered in these classes. We decided that we were going to use event sourcing for this to follow along the process and try to move away from this model of a status, status drop down. 
Because like most of our tools at that university, they started with some paper process. And as people got more comfortable with technology, they wanted someone else to do the data entry into their spreadsheets. <laughs> so we started with these paper forms and duplicated that in our forms on the web, took the information, dumped it into a big table, and then they got to use it. But for this application, a student would apply. They say, I want to take this class, and they would send it to our administrator, and the administrator would look at, did they meet the prerequisites? Had they paid their tuition for that semester? Could they take this class? And they would put their paper application in a pile, approved or rejected. Oh. And that, yeah, sorry. That approved re or rejected decision was kind of like a rubber stamp on the paper form that we were used to. But that rubber stamp can't really be erased. So when your process starts getting more involved and there are more steps in the process, you need something that's not going to be quite as permanent. And as these applications often did, instead of having our one column for status, we made a related table <laughs> to handle multiple statuses and try to keep track of that history. It was just a stopgap. But workflows like these become really complex really fast. You don't just have approved or rejected, but there might be a hold that just puts the application in a kind of waiting state while some information is collected. There were different reasons that a request or a request to be in this class might be rejected. And those were significant. And the holds might be because of money or um, their transcript didn't show that they met the prerequisites. Situation like this where the, you're using paper forms, a process that gets this complicated becomes a lot of stacks of paper. And each of these is a different status and it becomes pretty messy. But it also was really messy in our application. Panel that would allow them to change the status in the, for the student's request. And it seems like, yeah, that's going to make things really simple. They've got this little drop down. They can pick whether it's accepted, rejected, or pending. But this is what they came up with. <laughs> and it was, it was awesome because there were like nine pending states. And it wasn't just that they were pending. They were pending with some reasons. It was trying to explain why it was pending, but in the label of the status. It had just become complicated in the ways that older applications often do. So a student might be registered but need to go to a certain site location and all of that was captured in the label of the status. So that state shows us what has happened. The state is really that they're pending or accepted or rejected. And those reasons are important in our system but they're not important in that spot. By switching to an event-based system, we could record what actually happened, and we could uh, keep track of what the reasons were, what was happening for that student's request. We had a student information system that had uh, students' GPAs, uh, their prerequisites, things that we might need to look up, but it was updated in a view every day. And we needed to know when changes were happening and not just look it up every time. We needed to look at a certain student. So we created a place that we could detect these differences for the columns that we cared about and throw an event for each of these changes to the system. So those could be registered against our student. And our stu student would request a class and there might be some email back and forth between them and the administrator and the administrators would either accept the request or if they decided it wasn't going to happen, they just reject it outright. These events could all be captured. And some of the messaging that needed to happen back and forth could also be handled. So we were looking at our process in this way. A student requested enrollment. Prerequisites were met, so we let them know. Uh, their tuition hold was removed because the money was received. Another message could go to the student, and finally, the student could be enrolled in the class. 
This greatly streamlined the process for the administrators, and it also lightened a lot of their burdens. It connected the system to the student information, which had never been done before, um, that hadn't been authorized before. And it facilitated a lot of their communication. So it was a really valuable resource. Finally, my project with Inquest. This is a network security company. They've built a tool that's used in SOX for scanning network traffic and doing threat analysis. It's a very involved tool. Uh, if you go to the website, this picture is actually animated and you can see all of the sessions being handled and they go into the cup and it's really cool. But you can also see that the session is given a score based on how threatening it is in this space. And that score is a big part of why people want to use this product. But in order to show them the score and to compile this information, on my end, for the user interface, I worked on the API that displayed the results and compiled this information for the users. To query this, we were joining lots and lots of tables. And there were millions of sessions that were being recorded, lots of information across it. And to complicate things, the user who might be looking at that information might only have access to a small subset of it. So we, were, we had really complicated queries to look this information up. And we really wanted to capture the history of how a session had been detected, it had some files attached, those files were or were not threatening, and all of these things influenced the score of that session. We wanted to show the user why it had a score of four or nine, and show how that score might have been changed along the way. But the lifespan of the session itself was really short. So it was not a very costly uh, bit of information to look at just one session. So when we got to the session details, that was okay. It was just that the table was so huge, all of the tables were so huge, and all of the joins and everything, it just got really expensive. So we, would deci we decided we would log events for when the session was found, the files were discovered, when things were scored, what types of information, any other information that influenced the score. Because we wanted to be able to show the user something like this. In the details of this session, this is how the score came to be what it, what, what it is now. And it was a very helpful addition, but it wasn't something that we, that the whole application had been planned for. The session details page had a lot of information. You can see some of it is kind of grayed out in the background. It provided a lot of information and trying to load these pages was really slow most of the time. So when they decided that the users really needed the session history, it was going to be another costly query on our application. By using an event-driven uh, approach, we were able to only pull the events that were relevant to that session. And in this case, we were doing our projection on the fly. Only when a user wanted to see that history did we do our projection. So we also had a, a piece of this application that I didn't explain in the beginning is that all of the scanning was being done by the engine. It was a Python application. It was being done completely over there. And so all of the information I needed, I had to pull from these tables to show, show the results. Being able to throw events, having them create these events, saved us a lot of effort and time. And it was, it is going to be a, a valued approach in the future. We were able to build that session threat history without another costly query for the session details. This process was completely optimized for read because that's what we needed it for. And it was very little cost for the engine when it found the session and when it created the score, it was very little effort for them to now create an event that showed the information we needed to know. And going forward, we were going to use this audit log to 
help us migrate into a new system that was better architected for the types of data and the types of information we wanted to look at. We had a lot of sessions, um, but some of those sessions were kind of something else. And we were starting to do mail analysis in another application. But being able to move to an event sourced strategy was really, really helpful for going forward. It gave us a lot of options in our rewrite of our application. We would always have those events and we could treat them differently in our new system. And it was helpful since our application was somewhat uh, separated. The other team could create the events we needed to know and our application wouldn't have to carry so much of the weight that it had been previously. Uh, I think I talked about a few of these. Wanting to separate ourselves from that older schema. We wanted to have a better plan, treating everything as a session every time, and separating the logic of what it meant from the time that that information was detected. And I want to thank you very much for having me here. I welcome questions after if you want to talk about it. Um, I, I can tell you more about these applications if you have any questions. I think it's really helpful to look at the types of problems people are solving with these patterns to think about how you might be able to use them in your environment. And I also think it's important to find an easier way in to modernize some of these legacy applications because the reason that they're legacy and that they're so big is that they're super important and they've grown over time because people need them. And the idea of completely rewriting and throwing them away is not always the best, best strategy. Of the two that we completely rewrote, um, the second one I definitely would have rewritten, but we probably could have done a better approach in the scholarships application because it, it could have been done in pieces in a way that worked better for the size of our team. Um, I think that's enough. <laughs> Thank you very much.